See, I don't like drama, so I stay to myself. Stay focused on this rap ish and pray for the wealth. <laughs> Man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, fam. We're back. We're back with the second part of 10 ways to make money while incarcerated. 10 ways you can make money if you find your stupid locked up. If you're one of those people that just has to try it, just has to go get the free t-shirt and the tattoo. If you're the guy that just cannot stay out of trouble and insist on getting locked up, you might want to pay attention. And if you're somebody that's just curious on what happens, you know, that you don't see in the documentaries, that you don't see on television, that guys really don't tell you, then this video could be for you as well. But that's what we're doing today. Five more ways, five more breakdowns of how to make money while locked up. I never understood when I would see guys broke or just going without in there. It just it used to boggle my mind. It used to puzzle me. Like, how are you not, how do you not, you don't have nothing? You got all these dudes around you. There's so many ways to make, you can't come up with one way to make money. You can't come up with one way to get a suit, a stamp, an envelope, something, nothing. Maybe you got out and you need to watch this video. Me, myself, I was always a guy that, outside of prison and in the streets i worked a job i always kept a job i always believed in having several hustles but outside of that when i was in the streets i had several hustles i knew how to make money even though it was the the wrong way of making money and no it's not right don't glorify it stupid led me to being locked up handcuffed time and time again waste of time missed out on everything in life everything around you you see that is beautiful i missed out on it because i wanted to be that guy but in being out here in the streets since an early age, I learned how to hustle. I learned how to turn nothing into something. I would find out what people wanted, how I could get a hold of it, and then get it to them. And that's what we're doing today. Part two on how to make money while locked up. Five more ways. You know how to see it. You know how to live it. So let's relive it. When I think of ways to get money while locked up and different guys, type of guys, that I saw getting money, so many different come to mind, but one, one in particular stands out. It's not the drug dealer, it's not this guy, it's not that guy, it's the hustle man. Who is the hustle man? Let me break down the hustle man, then we'll get into a story about hustle man. The hustle man is the hustle man. That is the guy that can get you anything. He is hustle man. If you live in any big city, that guy that comes up to you, this randomly just trying to sell you things that you have. What the hell I want a yard gnome for? We ain't even got no grass. I live in a building. That guy or the guy that's always trying to sell you something you just don't need, that's hustle, man. In the penitentiary, summertime is when you really, really, really see the hustle, man. And they're out on the yard. I got the shakes that'll make you quake. I got the fries that'll cross your eyes. Mm -hmm. I got the burgers that'll... Just got burgers. These guys are walking, they got sweatpants, they got jeans, they got fresh white tees, socks, boxers. Then if you want anything else, they can get it. They take requests. I told y'all about jingling. Jingling was a cheek buster. But outside of busting cheeks, jingling was hustle man. He would get things, he would spot his victim, figure out what they liked, and he would go get it. And then he would dangle it in front of their face until they just had to have it. And he had to have it. And there you go. But the hustle man, his job is to find what you're looking for. I remember I went to him one time and I said, look, I'm looking for these two tapes. Yes, at this time you could still order tapes. Tapes were still a big thing. I had ordered a tape player off of the commissary, off of personal property. And they had just stopped letting us get music in prison that had cursing on it. We're locked. You got what? We can only get the clean version? I guess they were trying to make prison a better place by putting in music that didn't have profanity in it. I said, Jing Ling, there's these two tapes floating around. I'm looking for. I can't remember what the first one was, but I do remember the second tape I wanted was Flesh of My Flesh, Blood of My Blood by DMX. You get this tape, I got you. Didn't take him long. A day or two, he comes back. He's got both tapes. Give me two packs a piece. Now, what he's done is he has went and tracked down these tapes. So, in being a hustle man, you're going to put in some footwork. You're going to put the word out to other 
hustle men, other guys, guys that you know that deal with music because that's what I was looking for. And you're going to let them know, hey, if you know somebody got that DMX tape, I got a pack of cigarettes and a pack of Black and Miles for them. Somebody's going to come up with it. Thousands of people in this prison, 3,700 to be exact. He comes up with the tape. He comes to me. Hey, let me get two packs of cigarettes and I got you. I give him two packs of cigarettes. He gives me the tape. He's now going to take one of those packs of cigarettes, trade that off with two packs of Black and Milds. He came up a pack of Blacks off the deal. That is the hustle man. Hustle member also say you're the wine guy. You need ingredients. One of my viewers actually commented and said he flashed back watching my last video because he used to take things out of the chow hall that guys needed to make pruno, mash, alcohol. Two of them things being sugar and yeast. Two of the main ingredients in getting alcohol, you know, from its point of fermentation to the point that you can drink that nasty ish. The hustle man also, hey, I need 100 oranges. These are oranges that the penitentiary provides you with. Every man gets an orange on his tray. He goes to the kitchen man, hey, I need 100 oranges. What you gonna charge me for those 100 oranges? Do I gotta bring them back? Does my mule gotta bring them back? Or can I pass them out the tray slot and you take them back? Usually the hustle man himself is gonna put the work in because he don't wanna share with nobody and he's gonna bring them back. Just like that, the kitchen man might have charged him $5 for 100 oranges in a big ass bag. He's going to bring them back to me or bring them back to you if you're that guy that's locked up making wine. And he's going to charge you double whatever he charged him. The hustle man essentially is the middleman. He's also the same guy that will go in the yard and buy up all the illegal stuff that's on the yard, all the weed, the pills, and he'll sit back and wait. Now, when there's none around, he'll break his out. It'll be a smaller amount than what you would usually get. And he sells it off and he doubles his money. He takes sweatpants that he got from one guy. He stays next to a guy that's getting ready to go home. The hustle man always knows who's about to leave. Because in knowing who's about to leave, he can get all that guy's stuff. He can then take that stuff and recirculate that stuff back into the prison population. Not everybody's got $25 or you'll get a set of headphones. Not everybody's got $20 for a pair of sweatpants. But the hustle man has got them half price. I got those sweatpants. $10, I got those sweatpants. These are, damn, it's a big ass sweatpant. 6X, it's all my 6X dudes. Uh, man, maybe I can cut these half and make two pairs of sweatpants. The hustle man has got them. My homeboy, Bunkin. Bunkin is now back in prison doing 16 years. Shout out to, to Big Bunk, man. Sorry that you gone again. He was a big, big man. When I mean Bunkin was big, Bunkin at the time was... Probably about 350. He was the hustle man as well. He had a way of getting things that the rest of us couldn't get. He had these pair of black Reebok shorts that had Reebok printed all over the shorts. It's like a black pair of shorts that says Reebok a thousand times. Not a thousand, but just everywhere you can squeeze the word Reebok in white print on these shorts. It was there. When Bunkin left, he left me all his stuff. All his blue CDs, CD player, everything that was his that is common to do amongst friends when a friend goes home. He leaves me these Reebok shorts that are, I can't even stretch wide enough to show you on camera. They're massive. They're probably every bit of a 5X. I don't know what, what am I gonna do with some 5X shorts? In comes the hustle man. Hustle man comes to me. You got them shorts bunk ahead? I do. What you want for them? What you want with them? Man, what you want for the shorts? Man, you ain't gonna keep them. Why you acting like you don't wanna sell them? What you want for them? Huh, they're exclusive, man. What do you want for the shorts, Jay? Give me $15. All right, I'll be right back. No, 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 no. I'm going to give you a list of what I want for the $15. You're not about to go get me a bunch of Pepsi and toothpaste. and No, I'll give you a list. You go to commissary. Bring me the stuff that I order, and I'll give you the shorts. I give the shorts to Hustle Man. Hustle Man then takes these shorts over to the guy that sews. That's another hustle, sewing. Takes them over to the guy that sews. Hey, Break these down, turn them into skirts. You're not gonna believe me when I tell you this. I go out in the yard a couple days later, I look around and what do I see? The boys, you always see the boys, the gay guys. But there's something a little bit different about them than what I'm used to seeing. What am I seeing? They're wearing skirts. Skirts that say Reebok all over them. The hustle man is taking the shorts, 
to the guy that sews. Had the guy cut these, make them in like little tube skirts, and has now sold these skirts for ten, fifteen dollars to all these random boys. So he then took that fifteen dollars and flipped it and turned it into sixty. Being the guy that knows how to get his hands on things, can seek out what the next man is finding, looking for, find it, get it, acquire it, tax a price onto it, and then sell it to the next man is by far one of the greatest hustles there is. Even out here in the streets, anybody that's ever been into the, you know, getting high or doing drugs, you know, you go down in the projects, you might not come up on nobody out there hustling. But there's always somebody out there that knows where to get it at. But what he's going to do is he wants some. He wants a percentage. Either you're going to pay him or you're going to give him some or buy him some. That is the hustle man, essentially. He's the guy you pull up on that when you need something, he can go get it for a price. Shout out to the hustle man. Next way to make money without a doubt and one of the smartest ways to make money, which also comes with a lot of risk, is making alcohol. Who doesn't like to drink? Even a man that does not drink will drink while he's locked up. What I got to lose? My life sucks. I have failed at everything. I'm about to drink away my pain. I'm about to drink away my sorrows. The act of making alcohol is relatively easy. All the things you need are right there within the jail or right there within the prison. The sugar, we get that from the candy. Candy is sold right on commissary. They would used to know, believe me now, the guards got slick to it. They would watch whoever was buying large amounts of candy, check commissary slips. The hell he need 30 bags of candy for? Hard candy? Oh, no, we need to shake. Give about three days, shake him down, and I guarantee that candy's being turned into alcohol. Candy, fruit, and some type of yeast. I could get raw yeast because we had the main kitchen at Greensville. You would mix those three. You take these oranges, you would peel them apart, and you put them in a bag. Now, you're going to have to pay for the oranges unless you're going to go to the chow hall. I've actually gone to the chow hall. Let me get that orange. Let me get that orange. Let me get that orange. And get everybody's orange, cut the lining of my jacket, and fill the inside of my jacket up with oranges. Get a couple of my homeboys to do it. If I can get out of there with 30, he can get out of there with 30, he can get out of there with 30. We just got out with 90 oranges. We can make five gallons of wine. Them oranges peeled, put in a bag, smushed all up. That candy gets dropped in. We throw cup of yeast in and if you don't got yeast we use honey buns or we use bread something of that nature and then we start pouring sodas in i like the orange sodas and then i like the uh butterscotch i like the butterscotch i thought they eat the butterscotch in there with the orange soda or the butterscotch and the, and the root beer or the root beer barrels with the root beer soda mix all that stuff together so now you've got your candy you've got your yeast which is bread a honey bun something of that nature and you've got your fruit you put it in this bag, you tie it in a knot, you wrap it in a blanket so it stays warm and you put it off to the side. What's gonna happen is it's gonna start to ferment. And as it ferments, it's gonna release gas. And this gas is gonna fill that bag and you're gonna watch that bag that's got all this stuff in it. It's a big bag of just bleh. It's gonna start to swell and swell and swell until you've gotta do what's called burping. You have to untie that bag and let the air out, let the gas out or the bag will explode and then it's a very, very bad day when the bag explodes. I've had it happen. It's none of your favorites. That's a bad day. It's all bad when the bag pops. But you burped this bag. We had these holes in the side of the toilet that worked as a vent to suck air out the cell. I would burp it. Let the air out the bag. That's the act of burping. Right into the vents in the side of the toilet. It would fill back up. The air would expand. These things would get to the point that they were, we called it cooking. The bag would be cooking so much and it'd just be firming so much fast and so much gas would be coming off of it that we would have to take shifts. You couldn't go to sleep and leave that thing over there and sleep for six hours because it's going to blow up. So me and my cellmate would take turns. Hey, man, you watch it for three hours and then I'll get up and I'll watch for three hours. Once it starts where it's rolling, once it starts with that bag expanding every few hours, you got to stay on top of it. After a couple of days of no sleep, a couple of days of watching this thing and burping it, nurturing it, treating it like a little baby and taking care of it, that bag is gonna stop expanding. Once it no longer expands, that means it's done cooking. And when I say cooking, this does not require heat. That is just the word we use for what's taking place. Once that bag no longer expands, there's no longer any more gases being released into the bag and you see that it doesn't swell anymore, 
it's done. I would holler at the chow hall guy. These guys are required to wear hairnets anytime they cook, anytime they serve food, they gotta have gloves on and a hairnet. You've seen them in the movies, old prison movies, they got the hairnet on. It's a true fact, you have to wear hairnets. I get that hairnet and I usually get a few because they're not the greatest, but they work. And then I would strain it. I get a, a gallon jug that they put this chemical cleaning solution in. I take it to the shower, to the wash sink, and I clean it out until you could drink clean water out of it, until it was like the day it was produced. And then I would pour this bag into cups and I would put that strainer above that jug and I would strain the stuff through it so that just the liquid came out and all the bleh, nastiness stayed in the hairnet. Five gallons. You're talking whatever you really want to charge for a cup. At around the time, around that time we were charging, it depends on who it is, between six to eight dollars a cup. Two cups are gonna get you nice. Three cups are gonna get you lit. Five cups are gonna get you put in a hole because you're gonna act a whole entire fool because you're gonna be in prison and you're gonna be drunk. Alcohol, the act of taking candy they sell you, the food they supply you with Michelle. These are all things that are readily available all around you that for less than I think when we make five gallons of it it would usually the whole process including the sodas the candy you know the bread the oranges the whole thing would be under twenty dollars to make five gallons now you're charging eight dollars a cup and we would get I think it was don't quote me on it. I want to say we got eight cups to a gallon so them eight cups sixty four dollars Multiply that times five, you've mouth 300 and some dollars from what started off as $20. $20 in candy, sugar, honey buns, and oranges has now turned into 300. But it doesn't always work that way. Me, I used to be a heavy drinker. Me, even when I was locked up, if I get my hands on alcohol, it's going down. I would drink. I would keep two and a half gallons for myself and then sell the other two and a half gallons to other guys. Every, it would be like twice a week, we could do five gallons. As soon as that five gallons was done, boom, we drop another five gallons. So 10 gallons of alcohol in a week's time. $8 a cup, you're banking. It was a great hustle. It's another one of those turning nothing into something. Ingenious, ingenuity, knowing how to hustle, how to make something out of nothing. Who doesn't drink? Everybody wants alcohol. Alcohol was one of the things that was always in demand. You didn't have to sell the alcohol. The alcohol sold itself. Them guys would smell that smell coming out the, out the cell, and they'd be on it. We'd have to cover the smell up, especially when we were making clear, which is liquor. But when you're making it, it smells so bad. You walk into the pod, you can smell it. If you're an officer and you walk in there and these guys are burping, I'm in the act of burping it, you're going to smell it. I'm going to light an incense. I'm putting baby powder in the air. I'm doing everything I can to mask the smell. And that don't work, I'll take a bag of popcorn, I'll go to the microwave, and I'll throw it in there for 10 minutes. You know what a bag of popcorn that's been popped for 10 minutes smells like? Terrible. It smells like 10-minute burnt popcorn. And that's all you smell. You cannot smell anything over the smell of a burnt popcorn or even worse, a burnt soup. I'll take that popcorn bag, crush that ramen noodle up, put it inside that bag, throw that bag in the microwave and I'll let it burn. I've burned it to the point that the bag caught on fire, but it covers up the scent of the alcohol. The guards got hip to it. They used to come in and smell the burnt popcorn or smell the burnt noodles and be like, all right, whoever's making alcohol in here, we ain't stupid. We smell the noodles, y'all need to be tightened up. And there'd be somebody up at the front going, nah, man, I've accidentally burnt my popcorn. It's your popcorn, let's go to your cell. You're the one that burnt it, you're probably the guy making alcohol. And we would drink the nastiest, what we thought tasted good, but the nastiest wine you could ever imagine that would get you super lit. Gone, I mean just completely smashed while locked up. Making wine, that is truly the definition of taking a little of something and turning it into a whole lot of something else. Two, three batches of wine, and you've made enough commissary to now live for the next two to three months. I had one of the most highly sought after jobs you could have while in prison, being the maintenance man. For anybody that's been locked up here in the state of Virginia or has done time in prison here in Virginia, 
and you've dealt with the maintenance man, you have to deal with the maintenance man at some point or another. And we'll get into why you have to deal with this guy, why you would have to deal with me and how at one point or another, I was gonna get in your pocket. Here in the state of Virginia, if you're a maintenance worker, you work with what's called a green shirt. You have correctional officers, you have your staff, just like in the kitchen, you have the kitchen lady. She is not an officer. She is a woman that works in the kitchen that comes from the outside that knows the kitchen like the back of her hand. When it comes to the maintenance department, you have a maintenance man, also known as a green shirt. He's good with his hands. He knows how to fix things. He was hired by the prison to fix things. He's not gonna do a lot. He has the, the know-how. He's got the knowledge up here to fix anything, but his job more or less is to make sure that it gets done. He goes around, he finds employees. Three guys to a maintenance crew. There was three maintenance men, which were the green shirts, which each had three guys that worked for them. Good men, I salute y'all. Thank y'all for treating me like a human being while I was locked up. And thank y'all for everything that y'all taught me that I carry to this day things that I use in day-to-day -day life to feed my family. And being the maintenance man, you could get your hands on things that nobody else had access to. Black tape, electrical tape, can be used for a million different things. Hot glue, you know, like you put in a hot glue gun, can be used for a million different things. Cable cords, it's crazy. You sleep on the top bunk and on the property, commissary, they only sell a six foot cable cord. With me being the maintenance man, I can get you a cable cord that's 20 feet long if you want. We have spools of cable. We put the ends on, we clamp them down. Give me your order. What do you want, a 12 foot cable cord? You want this to be able to reach around the cell twice? Bet, I got you. The cable cords was a big hustle. If you're on the top bunk and the little shelf on the top bunk from where you screw your cable cord into where your TV sits is about nine feet away, which means you have to leave your television sitting down on the bottom for the guy on the bottom bunk that you don't even like to watch all day, which means you're on the top bunk, leaned over the side, staring down at your television. So a big necessity, something you're definitely gonna need is a much longer cable cord. The only person that can get you that cable cord is why? The maintenance man. We talked about the repair guy, Mr. Fix-It. Mr. Fix-It needs me on a regular basis. Mr. Fix-It needs scraps of wires. There's this stuff, this stuff called flux that when you're soldering, you need flux. We would use it to sweat pipes, to solder pipes, if you may, but it's actually called sweating pipes when you solder copper. We put the flux on the pipe. Having flux that comes in a little white container is a necessity if you're a guy that solders and fixes TVs. But there's much more. Here in Virginia, they came in and they tried to figure out a way to cut back on the penitentiary bills. Our water bill is too high. We got 3,700 people locked up. How can we cut back on the water bill? What can we do? Hmm. They came in and they installed these buttons. You could flush your toilet twice within an hour. If you push that button more than twice, it would lock itself and it would not flush again for another hour. It would take 60 minutes to reset before you could flush again. Twice, whenever you use the bathroom, we do what's called a courtesy flush. When it drops, psh, you reach behind you and you flush, you flush to try to keep the smell out the cell. The next man don't wanna be in his bunk watching TV and smell what's dropping out your, over there on the toilet. So you constantly are flushing. If it's coming out, you flush, flush, flush. You'll hear the toilet, psh, 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 psh. Do that twice, now the toilet's locked. Now everything you just dropped in the toilet, if you and this guy are locked in a cell together, for the next hour, y'all gotta sit in there with Mr. Brown just backstroking in the toilet, Mr. Hanky just over there laying in the toilet. Now how nasty that is, how irritating that could be that, why did you flush the toilet more than twice, huh? Now I gotta sit in here, what if I gotta pee? I gotta go over there and pee with your, in the toilet? No, that's where I come into play. You put in a request for him, hey, my toilet's messed up, hey, I have bad water pressure in my sink. That request form is gonna make it to my boss. Your name, your cell is gonna get added to the list of things to be repaired. I'm already gonna know what's going on. You can come to me and say, AJ, 
Can you get my, there's a chase closet. It's like a utility closet where the plumbing pipes go to and wiring goes to. In between every cell and the cell beside it, there's this closet. Jay, can you take the flush thing off my toilet, the little switch, so I can get unlimited flushes? Yeah, I got you. But you know when they come back down, when they come back around on shakedown, they go in and check every closet. They're going to look to see if it's been messed with, and they're going to put it back, and you got to pay me again. All right, cool. What are you going to charge me? Give me two bags of coffee. I would literally go in there, tell my boss, hey, let me see the flathead screwdriver. His water pressure needs to be adjusted. And when my boss isn't looking, I'll take the screwdriver and I, I got my left hand and I'm, I'm adjusting his water pressure, turning the pressure up on the cold water. I reach up, click, 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 flip that little switch. I've now turned off the little thing that limits your water. There are other things, guys in there. The temperature is set to one temperature when it comes to the showers year round. I don't care, summertime, wintertime, it's set at one temperature and that's usually hot as hell, scold you. Unless you're in the hole where the water is always cold however cold the, the outside temperature is minus 20 degrees and that's the water that's gonna be hitting your back in the summertime guys wanted cold showers oh well, nobody want to go take no hot shower after playing softball running full court basketball coming down the shower temperatures 108 degrees aj we need you to turn the showers down all right all right what pay me we gotta pay you to turn the shower water down yeah it's not supposed to be messed with I can get in trouble for touching it. Lose my job, go to the hole. You don't ever do anything in this lifetime that comes with risk without being paid. Man, what you gonna charge us? This is harder to get to. So I give them a price, guys will come up with the money. Boom, I turn the water down. Now all five of our showers got good 86 degree water. You can go in there and take a nice chilly shower in the middle of summertime. But with the maintenance job came one of the biggest and most demanded things in the penitentiary weapons and though i'm not proud that i produced weapons that i made weapons that i sold weapons it was part of the hustle shanks and prison go together like milk and cereal shoe and shoelace so on and so on guys would find themselves in a situation most guys can't just make a knife they got hip to where guys were getting metal from and where guys were breaking things off of and they came in and started redoing all these things so that these type of materials became harder and harder to get your hands on. I work in a maintenance shop. There are pieces of metal laying over there that are from this big up to three feet long. Also a grinder that we grind with in the metal in the, in the maintenance shop. The lawnmowers that go around the outside, there's a lawn crew that cuts the grass at the prison. Penitentiary grass is always about this high. They cut grass nonstop, either push mowing, rod mower, but you have a, a, a grounds crew that cuts the grass. These lawnmower blades are constantly sharpened. They would bring the mowers in, we would take the blades off, and we'd go to the grinding wheel, nye, nye, slinging sparks, sharpen. There were days that I stood over there for four or five hours straight, sharpening buckets full of lawnmower blades. My boss sitting at the desk on the computer or kick back taking a nap, and while he's in the midst of doing that, I pull out these pieces of metal and I get to sharpening. I'm right in the maintenance shop inside the prison using tools that are provided by the prison, metal that's provided by the prison. And here I am sharpening these weapons, making weapons. I then take these things and we had a maintenance cart that we would push around with all our tools on it. And I would stash them on the maintenance cart. And then when we made our way back to the building, back into general population, back around the guys. When nobody was looking, I'd already had somebody, usually my cellmate or somebody I was close to, that was gonna take the, uh, the, the pick off. They was, uh, somebody's gonna run distraction, they gonna come by them, pass it off to them, and they gonna keep it moving in that direction or this direction, that, that direction. The good thing about making weapons was the amount of money that could be made from making weapons. The bad thing about making weapons is, is knowing that at some point or another, somebody's gonna get hurt. I used to justify it by saying, well, if I don't make it, somebody else will. Just like drug dealers justify selling drugs. If I don't sell it to him, somebody else is going to sell it to him. I'd also seen situations where weapons I had made had come into play and I now had to worry about. That's a scary feeling when you know what that man's holding his hand and what it's capable of because you made it. You know how sharp it is. You know that no matter what it hits, it's not going to bend. It's not going to ding. 
is straight iron. It's steel. It's a piece of rebar that's been grinded at the tip that's 12 inches long. It's not big into selling gangs knives. I'm not supplying weapons for all these gang members when they're the number one people in here that cause trouble. And I'll be the first person that they tell them because I'm not a gang member. Remember, it's not snitching if it ain't your homeboy. Somebody told me one time, you snitch on a white dude and ain't snitching. It's kind of the same thing with some of these gang members. Man, I ain't telling none of the homies. I ain't telling none of my homeboys. I wouldn't give weapons to dudes that I really felt like were just going to go out there and start attacking people. But I did keep weapons available. The maintenance gig by far is probably, I would say, as far as prison jobs go and hustles go, top five. Not to mention you get paid by the hour. You get to go all over the prison, the parts of the prison that nobody else ever sees. I've seen the warden's office. I've been in the guards' break rooms fixing stuff. I've been in places that other inmates would never see. I've legitly been in every single cell in Greensville Correctional Center. Every cell. There's not one that I have not been in there because we welded the... They took these, when they closed Southampton Penitentiary, they brought in these ladders that they we welded from the bottom bunk to the top bunk. Prior to that, you had to step on the stool, step on the counter, and then hop up on the top bunk. They brought these ladders in these metal ladders, and we welded them to the side of the bunks. I literally welded a ladder in every single cell in Greensville. The maintenance gig, by far, hands down, one of the best jobs you can get. Looking back on it, if you get in there, Take the blessing for what it is. Do not produce weapons. Do not hand out things that are going to hurt other people. Did I make money by doing it? Yes. I had a million different ways of making money. And if I could go back and do anything different, I would not have made weapons. But the maintenance gig coming in today at number three. These next two I'm going to mention are kind of one in the same. You have the mail room. This is the place that all mail comes to. It all gathers here. It comes in from a, a mail carrier, and they usually, I've seen them come in. They come in big baskets. Thousands of men locked up. Thousands of letters coming in. And they come in in these big baskets. They go into the mail room. They're then sorted. Some facilities allow inmates in the mail room. Some do not. Some facilities have one officer, and all the rest of the mail room is inmates. You got to think, with that much mail coming in, it takes a lot of people to sort through all this stuff. Say you've had your girl send you some pictures, some exclusive pictures, not some uh, lingerie, but some, some, some serious nature type pictures. And you got to get them pictures. All you got is the memories in your head of what she looked like and what y'all used to do. And you can read in between the lines. But now she done sent you something to refresh your memory. No sooner than the guard opens that envelope up and sees it. Damn. Hey, come here. Check my boy. What's the, let me see what, what's the name and address on this. Man, I'm about to. Yeah, now they're looking at your girl's pictures. Not only that, you're going to get a little piece of paper that says your pictures are confiscated. They do not meet the criteria. They were partially nude or nude. Anybody that's been locked up, ever attempted this, knows about this heartbreaking, depressing, sad letter you get when you find out you're not getting the pictures. Some girls just think it's okay to send these pictures not knowing the prison's not going to allow it and the guards are going to take it. Tell your homeboy that works in the mail room, I got a letter coming in. It's coming in from such and such. He gets his hands on it or tells one of the other guys in there, hey, be on the lookout for a letter to such and such. If you get it, throw it to the side. Let me get that. He's going to bring it to you. Those pictures... They're priceless. What would you pay for pictures of your loved one, butt ball, not known? Someone you know, someone you've been with, that you got these great memories of, and now you can have pictures? Whatever price that man names, you're going to pay. And he's going to make sure that those pictures end up in his pocket, or he's going to look at them. There's a good chance that once he gets his hands on your pictures, when nobody's looking, he's going to slide off in the bathroom, and he's going to go to town, he's going to get money, in the name of your girl's pictures. You know he's going to see your girl's pictures. But they're going to make it back to you. He makes a killing. Guys are coming to him non-stop. With the request. Hey, I got this coming in, this coming in, this coming in. Make sure that gets to me. Personal property. Personal property is a section of the prison. It's usually a building by itself. Where anything that you order must first come in. From televisions, sneakers, 
jogging pants, jeans, arts and crafts, CDs, magazines, everything first comes through there. You have an officer that sits there with an engraving gun all day and engraves your name and your state number on whatever it is you ordered. The television has got your name and your state number engraved. That CD player has got your name and your state number engraved on it. Personal property is also the place that everything that gets confiscated, TV, CD players, things you get caught with that you're not supposed to have, it all goes back to personal property. During shakedown, they come in with a big folder and in this folder, it's got everybody in that pod's property slips. The property slip shows everything that you have purchased since you've been in the prison. When they come in your cell to shake down, they come in with that piece of paper. Damn, boy, you broke as a bit. You ain't got nothing. They look over, there's a TV on the counter. Let me look at this paper again. Ain't no, ain't no TV on the slip. You got a CD player, you got beard trimmers, you got, man, you got four fans, you got everything. But this piece of paper says, you ain't got nothing. That stuff is going to get confiscated and it's going to go skirt back over the property. At which point they say they destroy it. They're supposed to throw it in the trash. It gets compacted and taken out on the back of a big tractor trailer. But in reality, what happens is that guy in personal property, there's trash and property. The guards spit in. They might throw the McDonald's cup in. They ball paper up, throw it in. They shred paper. It goes in. That trash can has now got to be removed from there and wheeled out to the dock and compacted. But that guy that works in personal property has got a better idea. My homeboy T had the greatest idea. What if when that trash can goes to the dock, instead of just having trash in it, it's got all this stuff that's been confiscated. What if it's got two fans in it, a bag full of CD players, a whole bunch of CDs, all this stuff that's been confiscated. When they took smoking out of the prison, they would confiscate whatever tobacco they found and they took it over to personal property. Hmm. T starts loading these trash cans up, selling them out to the loading Dr. Smitty. Other guys bring trash cans from their building out there for the trash to be dumped. Smitty swaps trash cans with them and they now return to the building with his trash can that is filled up with electronics, filled up with bags of tobacco, cartons of Newports. All that stuff belongs to T. He's gonna break a little bit off for the dock man that sits out there all day compacting trash. And he's gonna break a little bit off for the guy that pushes that trash can back to the building. But everything else in that trash can is now his. He's got everything you could think of. Them CD players that are $50 on property, give me $20 for it. I got 10 of them, what's it matter? $200. There's two TVs in that trash can. These are thin 13 inch TVs, don't take up a lot of space. $213 on property, have your people send me $100 and it's yours. Here's the beautiful thing about also being the property man. Do you know why that slip showed up to yourself and said you had nothing on it? Because you didn't buy anything. He works over in property. He can pull your file. That TV he just sold you, he can go back in your file and write TV. Put the serial number on it and slide that right in your folder. So when they come in on shakedown, oh man, you, you do own a TV. It's right here on the paper. If it's on the paper, it must be true. Now when that TV comes in your possession, another guy that hustles in there is going to be needed. I told you, everybody gets a piece of the cake. The tattoo man comes into play when it comes to personal property because he's got a gun that not only tattoos skin, but can engrave plastic. He can put a paper clip on that tattoo gun rather than a tattoo needle and take a razor and scrape the plastic where that name was engraved. Take a piece of emery cloth sandpaper that's purchased from the maintenance man and sand that name off. Then you take floor wax and skim it across the back there where it was sanded off, where it's all dull and hazy from where the last name was removed. You're going to wax it after you've purchased the sandpaper from the maintenance man and you've had the tattoo man come over there he's gonna now engrave your name and your state number just like they would over in property he's done this so many times now that he's pretty much mimicked the lady that sits over in property all day because they usually put their initials beside it i used to engrave things i got it down it was pt at the time was the lady that was worked over there she would pt and then a circle around it i got it down to a t to the point that i almost had her writing down packed and then her initials down packed. 
So that guy that works on property, everything that's getting confiscated is going back to him, and then it's making its way back into population. I see the guards like, I know I confiscated this last week. I know I took this. How am I taking this again? But you can't accuse, you can't prove he did anything without being able to prove he did something. Another thing with the personal property are the freak books. Mr. Nasty, Nasty Tom. Them books they come in. Y'all don't notice, but most penitentiaries do not allow magazines in there that show penetration or anything. Like, we could get, like, Playboys, but anything that was, like, really, really graphic that really showed something going on, you couldn't get your hands on. That guy, T, that works on property... Them books, that's part of personal property. That didn't go to the mailroom. That comes to property. That's an outside vendor. That's coming to him. But he's coming back with all of them. Do you know just one of those pictures? One can be photocopied. And a hundred copies of just one picture out of that book will be made in black and white form. And them things will sell $2, $3 for that one picture. That entire book, that entire, we call it a freak book, that entire magazine that's never been cut apart, that's never been contaminated that is fresh into the penitentiary that nobody else has seen that magazine is worth hundreds of dollars for you to get that magazine from him he's gonna give you an outrageous price and you're gonna pay it because there are not many things that bring you pleasure in here not everybody messes with the boys and that relief that seeing that woman seeing that act that familiar feeling the the release of just the Everything that comes with that moment is much needed. And men are willing to pay whatever they got to pay. Personal property, mailroom, two of the greatest hustles there is. Once again, this is something the prison supplies and you just step in between. Make sure it gets from point A to point B. And you're eating good. Facts. This last one is one that... By far, I've probably seen the most money be made, which is the inmate advisor, the jailhouse lawyer. Every jail, every prison has an inmate advisor. If you catch a charge while incarcerated, just a jailhouse charge, not a charge that's going to require you to go back in front of a judge, but you have broken one of the rules that the prison has in play. They're going to hit you with an institutional charge, which can be loss of canteen, loss of good time, loss of visitation, loss of phone. There's so much that can happen when you catch one of these charges. You have the right to an attorney, just like on the streets. That's what an inmate advisor is. He is the inmate that's locked up that knows a little bit about the law. Some of these guys know a lot about the law. Don't get it twisted. Some of these guys are great at what they do, but most of them just know prison policy, prison politics. They've been around long enough to know that you know the loopholes, how to get around this by doing this and doing that. You're gonna catch charges. I don't care who you are. Guards at times will not like you and write you up for absolutely nothing. I've been written up for stepping over the yellow line. I've been written up for not being in my cell the moment. Hey, lock down. Hey, I'm gonna grab a cup of ice. You're in an unauthorized area. You didn't lock down. You got a charge. What? There's 70 other people that still ain't locked down. Disband direct order. You got rolled up. Now you got to go to the inmate advisor. Hey, man, look. I'm about to go home. If they find me guilty in this charge, it's going to change my release date. I'm going to be in here another 13 days, another 52 days, like all over this guard not liking me. Look, calm down. This is what we're going to do, right? First of all, what was the charge? Oh, man, that's bad. They always want to try to make you feel more stressed than you should be. Oh, man, that's bad. Yeah, that's real bad. Damn, dog, I don't want to see you 52 more days. All right, look, here's what we're going to do. He's going to run it down to you. He's going to make it sound great. He's got a way to beat the charge. But you got to pay to play. Hey, look, I'm going to spank that charge for you. Matter of fact, I might be able to holler at the hog guy. Or the maintenance guy when he's in there this week working on something. And get him just to pull the charge off the desk and disappear. But you got to pay. Man, look, I just want to go home, man. I don't want to catch no more time. This guard wrote me up. The inmate advisor is a friend indeed when a friend is in need. He's going to charge you. 
These are also guys that do things that I really did not like. They would prey on people's hope, on the hope of one day going home. Say you haven't even caught an institutional charge. Say you're just locked up doing your time. And this guy gets wind of your case and he sees you over there all the time with your folders and you're writing appeals and you're doing your habeas corpus and you're doing all these different levels of appeals to higher courts trying to get back in court, get some of this time to get out. The inmate advisor is the guy you're going to work close to because he knows the law. I have seen some of these men. This is a fact now. I've seen some of these men sit with guys, get them back in court, get their sentences reduced. I've seen inmate advisors get guys released from prison and they still be in there themselves. That's got to be a terrible feeling, but good feeling. It's good knowing something you did got this man out and got him home with his family. He's free. He's out in the free world again. He's with his kids, but you're still locked up. You did something for him that you can't do for yourself, that nobody can do for you because there was an error in his case. Men will pay whatever you ask them to pay because let's look at it like this put a price on freedom there is none these guys will instill hope hey look i can work on your case yeah look i got a friend that's a lawyer i'm gonna push your case this first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna attack this section we're gonna attack this section you've got your people sending him money like he is johnny cochran and this guy is sitting there he's filing motions he's filing motions damn you got turned down we talked about this. We knew this was going to happen. We're going to push it to the next level. Don't worry about it. We ain't out to fight yet. Man, you sure I'm going to get out of prison? Look, I can't make no promises. He's not going to tell you no because at the moment he tells you no, you're not going to pay him anymore. The inmate advisor banks. There are some guys I've seen that are good guys that barely charge anybody anything, but they all charge. They have to charge to, A, make it worth their while. Their whole life revolves around legal work. They're wearing the same uniform as you. They lock in a cell just like you. They just have better wordplay. They know better wording. They know, you know, case logs, case numbers. They have all these books with all these different cases in it. They've been doing it. Some of these inmate advisors I've met have been doing this 25, 30 years and have never gotten anybody out. Now I've met inmate advisors that have been docked down 25, 30 years and have gotten four or five guys out. But their main job is to help you beat that institutional charge. Their main job is to make that sergeant, that lieutenant, that officer that don't like you, that wrote you up, look stupid. And them officers do not like anything. The one thing they hate the most is you making them look stupid or you proving that they lied. When that paperwork comes back that you beat the charge, you see him in the hallway like, huh, yeah, stupid, write me up again. Dumbass, I beat your dumbass charge, dummy. Learn how to read and write. Man, I can read and write. What are you, five, idiot? You wrote... I've seen them beat them based on the, the dates put on there, putting a the signature in the wrong place. There's so many different ways that you can beat a charge while locked up. But the main thing you need is that inmate advisor. And the main thing he needs is your money. Once again, and I want y'all to, to look at most of these things I've mentioned in, these, in this part one and part two. A lot of these ways to make money are tied back to jobs that are given to you by the prison. They're tied back to jobs that you're already being paid for. But if you're going to do anything outside of just what's called for with your job, guys got to play. They got to pay to play. Even with the maintenance, if you want me to do anything outside of what I'm supposed to be doing, you're going to have to pay. When it comes to the prison barber, if you want a fade, you're going to have to pay. You know, It's either that or you're getting an even Steven. The prison supplies jobs, and then guys then take those jobs and make a hustle out of something that they've already got. The inmate advisor, that guy, if you've ever met a guy that came out of prison and told you he was the inmate advisor and he didn't come out of prison with thousands of dollars, I'm going to promise you this. He wasn't the inmate advisor. Inmate advisors are some of the most highly paid men there are while in prison. They're also some of the best hustlers and at times, one of your biggest allies while being locked up. That was part, those part two of the 10 ways to make money while locked up part two is a little more of the complicated side the things you don't think of and everything i said in these 10 hustles is true everything i said with the 10 ways to make money is true it's a way you can get in there and feed yourself there are some guys that get locked up that have families backing them that have more money than they know what to do with that 
flood their loved one with money, money, money. They're sending money orders back to back to back to back to where this guy's got so much money, he ain't got nothing to worry about. Oh, somebody wants to hurt him, he'll pay for protection. He don't need to buy a knife. He can buy three. Why well, buy three knives? Well, he can just pay that guy to go buy three knives. And some guys have more money than they know what to do with. So they just piss their time away eating honey buns, doing this, doing that, getting high. Then you have some guys that have no help from the outside world. A lot of these guys, that's why they're in there to begin with is because they had no one to turn to on the outside world. So they get in there and they do what they have to. These are the guys you see that usually either have nothing or hustle the hardest. Me, I was a guy that was like in between. I had my mother in my corner from time to time. Shout out to my mom, I love you mom. If I needed something, like I really, really needed something, my mom was there. I could reach out to her and say, hey mom, I don't like to ask you for much. You think you could send a little bread? My mom would take care of the holiday packs for me. She always kept money on the phone. One thing I never did out here was cross my family. True indeed, I was a criminal. I can never escape my past. I can never get away from my history. My history is part of what makes me who I am today. But I never crossed the ones I love. I never stole from my family. I never hurt my family. I never did things that would make my family say, no, that's unacceptable. We can't back you. We can't back what you did. You're cut off. So my family was there for me. But I didn't like to rely on anybody. Even when I was free, I have pride. My pride is a serious issue, has always been and will always be. I don't like to ask anybody for anything. So I've always been a hustler. Going to prison just pulled that much more out of me. I'm one of those guys that thinks, you know, I'm a thinker, I think a lot. I watch, I observe. And one of the first things I did when I got in there is I started observing how all the guys around me were moving who was making what moves, how money was being made, how money was being transferred, how things were coming in. I got the system down packed, and then I decided, all right, these are gonna be my ways of making money. This is what I'm gonna latch on to. This is gonna be my spin on the game. And that's how I survived. That's how I did my time. That's how I came out with money. That's how I was able to live in there without being a burden to everybody else out here in society. I uh -huh. hope y'all enjoyed today's video. I enjoyed making it. I love y'all enjoying the vacation. Hope everybody's living their best life. But anyways, these jails, institutions, these prisons, these facilities, they're all just crazier worlds inside of a already crazy world that we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. To all my real ones And there are some real ones watching Cause y'all still watching me Man y'all know how we do Salute I'm going in I'm tired Good night